Um, so I'm going to talk about what this uh, particular section is all about, which is what shape is freedom. Uh, the reason that I'm both hosting the session and talking is because uh, the exposition that's out there represents an awful lot of work, and we haven't talked that much about it. I know that Ork has given a, a kind of huge um, sort of general view of what we've been doing in the project, but I thought I'd dive into some more specifics so you can see how weird and wonderful we are. And this also gives some context to some of the projects that are out in the exposition and some background on the journey that we've taken during these last wonderful three years. Uh, I work for RICE. RICE is now 3,200 researchers in Sweden, so we're actually the third biggest independent research institute in Europe. So behind Fraunhofer and some Dutch people, I can never remember what they're called. Um, in the work package I was given, we were supposed to look at sensors in a 3D printed house. That was how it was described in the original kind of uh, description. So we were supposed to look at the communication between the physical infrastructures and the people dwelling there. But we're a bit special, at, especially at Rice Interactive, because we never do what we're told and we never do what we're supposed to do. Um, and at the same time, we started realizing that additive manufacturing, especially 3D printing, had the potential to radically affect and change not only the way we view the buildings we live in, but actually the way we view our own lives. Uh, and we could essentially use this to question the influence that living in boxes has on us. So, um, I'm going to... <laughs> it's very funny that everybody's had this. I'm going to go to China, uh, just like everyone. This made me really, really angry and really, really happy when I saw it. Um, and we can just let her talk for a bit. Oh, sorry, that was a bit odd. These buildings behind me were not built in the normal fashion, but were actually printed out by a 3D printer. This printing method was developed by a private inventors. The 10 standalone one-story houses look normal at first sight. Yeah, they do look normal at first sight, which was the thing that made me really angry. Um, but I was very happy as well because it gave a very clear signal that this isn't really an appropriate way to use this technology. And I mean, um, the reason it's so wrong is that 3D printing gives us some very special potential. Uh, it can almost give us almost total freedom when it comes to the creation of forms, uh, at least on a small scale. Obviously, if you're starting to do things the size of a house, there are certain restrictions. Um, but as I've mentioned to a couple of people I was talking to earlier, one of the things we've really, really learned is that 3D printers don't see the difference between simplicity and complexity. For them, it makes no difference. They don't care what they're printing. They just go at it until it's finished. Um, so we see this as, I mean, I'm a designer. So this, this presents a huge palette of possibilities to work with. You could call it a spectrum of freedom. So um, with this potential, and if we have this much freedom, where do we start, and more importantly, where do we stop? Uh, I mean, anyone that's been presented with a design uh, problem knows that if there are no restrictions on it, it's actually really difficult. If you have restrictions, it gives you something to push against, so that's a much more kind of uh, interesting problem and an interesting place to be if you're designing. Um, so if our job was to look at the future way in which buildings could communicate and interface with their users, uh, then the obvious place to kind of go uh, was, um, you know, looking at electronics and functionality and shape and accessibility and all these things. So we looked around and kind of went, where is that? And the obvious thing is the Internet of Things, the IoT. Uh, there's a slight problem there. I really, really hate the Internet of Things. And we at Interactive really, really hate the Internet of Things. Um, there's a writer called Bruce Sterling who put it really, really well, I think. 
Uh, and the main thing is this bit in dark where he says, because the Internet of Things is not about things on the Internet, it's a world in which all our household gadgets can communicate with each other. And it may sound vaguely useful, but it's not really for the consumers. Okay, it's mainly for big industry. It doesn't really do that much to us. And somebody said to me at an EU meeting in Brussels, they said, well, you do realize that the only purpose of the Internet of Things is to sell us sensors we don't need. Okay, and that's a little harsh, but it actually contains a grain of truth. The only people that have really gained from the whole explosion of the Internet of Things are the people that sell sensors. So we posed a question. If we didn't want to fall into the Internet of Things trap, what would be the purpose of putting the sensors into these systems or 3D printed houses or whatever it was we were going to do in the end? And we came up with a solution, because that's what we do. We came up with a thing called Riot. And RIOT stands for the Responsible Intelligence of Things. Okay, so it says here, our premise is today very few of us can keep track of all the demands that sensible and sustainable lifestyle requires. So I don't know when it's smart for me to turn on my washing machine. But that's something we can use computers and sensors to do. So we said, okay, if we're going to do that and we're going to push it, um, then we start, we need to kind of look at things you know, how do things behave around us and can we make them behave in a way that actually helps us become much better citizens and behave more ecologically? So we came up with this, what we call the classic example, which is if it's sunny outside and you try to turn on a reading lamp, the reading lamp should move away from you because turning on the reading lamp is a stupid idea. And I'll do that again just so you can see. Okay, we think that's a sensible use of sensors. We like that. Okay, so we're, we're basically looking at this idea of can we create appliances and objects that are designed to steer us in certain ways of behaving. Okay, and we actually built, this is a working prototype that we have, which is a lot of people leave stuff on standby and they leave stuff plugged in. So at this, oh, hang on, I'm having a problem with my films today. That is weird. Okay, I just have to hang with me a minute. <coughs> See if it works now. Yeah. No. Okay, so this is a plug basically that if you leave stuff plugged in too long, it does this. Okay, and it does actually work. It will spit plugs out. Um, and you could say, well, why don't you just turn the plug off? But we're saying, but there's no educational value in doing that. Having something that actually spits plugs out is a very, very clear visual reminder that you left the plug in. Okay, so it's this kind of thing. We even wrote a series of rules for the appliances to follow. So I can read this. When it is possible to be more efficient, economical, or sustainable, I must always choose this option. So this is for the appliance. So this is how the appliance thinks. When it is detrimental to the environment or to the grid to run my functions, I must wait for an improvement in those relative conditions. If the task is urgent for my humans, I must inform them of the environmental consequence of proceeding immediately. I will always allow my humans to override points A and B, but this must be at least a two-stage process designed to give them time for reflection over the consequences of their actions. In other words, the machine should make it difficult for us to do the wrong kind of things. Uh, and anyone that's read iRobot by Isaac Asimov will be familiar with this kind of rule set. So we began thinking, okay, if we're, if we're doing this about the behavior inside the building, then we need to start thinking about the structure itself. Uh, what are the possibilities that these new techniques would open up, and what do they mean? So traditionally, barriers have been... I mean, buildings have been barriers between us and the elements, so we've been trying to keep you know, the wind, the rain, the sun, and the snow out. And that's especially obvious here if you're here in the winter. You know, I mean, I walk around in a T-shirt inside my house when it's minus 30 outside because I have a really, really well-built house that is designed to keep everything out. Uh, one of the problems with that is we may end up keeping people out as well. So, like, every person's house suddenly becomes their castle, which, from a social point of view, isn't particularly good. 
But we said, what if these new possibilities allowed us to welcome the forces of nature and use them? So instead of adding a wind turbine or a solar cell to an existing structure, could we design the building to actually do those jobs within its inherent structure? So, you know, would, would your building suddenly welcome the rain, welcome the sunshine, welcome the wind, and actually be able to utilize them to actually help you be more sustainable within the building? So we started a process of actually building a bunch of prototypes. And my films don't want to play on this computer. I'm going to try and just jiggle back and jiggle on. There you go. Um, so we basically went through a series of prototypes. And what we were doing with this is not only looking at the form, but we were also looking at 3D printing and trying to get the machines to actually behave quite badly. So we read the instruction book for the 3D machines and did everything it told us not to do to try and see what kind of forms we could produce from it. And there's a bunch of these out uh, if you go out to where the big screen is. Uh, so you're welcome to pick them up, look at them, play with them. If they break, we'll just print another one. Uh, we also began thinking more deeply about how these exteriors would re relate to the interiors. So, as I said, I mean, if we're living in boxes, boxes are fairly easy to define. The reason we live in boxes is they're fairly easy to build. You know, you can get a Neanderthal to build a, a box with a bunch of bricks, is the theory. Um, so we started saying, what kind of spaces would we create, could we create, and what shape is the future? And how would we measure the act of living in these spaces? How would we define what these spaces should be? And we basically, keeping very much with the design philosophy we have here in Umeå, which is all about embodiment. In other words, don't think about designing something, make it first, and then think about what you've made. We said we should return to the body, okay? It's our earliest unit of measurement. So, I mean, the pyramids were measured in something called a cubit. Does everybody know that? Which is the distance between basically your elbow and your fingertips. You know, the English thumb is that, you know, an inch is, and it's, in Swedish it's still called a tum, so a thumb. Um, so we said, how do we go about doing that? That's tricky. So what we did is we went and talked to some dancers and choreographers. We said, what would happen if we allowed them to do, like perform simple tasks, uh, and we'll kit them out in a motion capture suit? So we stuck loads of reflective balls on them and used some basically film, film technology to capture what they were doing. What that produced was a volume over time. So as they're moving, they're basically creating these planes and these points. We then took that volume and converted it into solid object, which looks like this. And we then started looking at how do you then take these forms and start to create rooms out of those. Okay, so is, do we think this is how you should be living? No, that wasn't the point. What we were trying to do was actually create a new vocabulary. We realized that new forms demand a new way of talking about them. Um, so you need a new set of tools just to be able to discuss these things and push these concepts further. So this was very much about trying to create a way of talking about what we were philosophically thinking about. So we see this as a very small beginning and a slightly crazy one. Um, just in closing, there's a quote from Winston Churchill, of all people, but he did have bricklaying as one of his hobbies. Uh, and he said, we shape our buildings, therefore they shape us. And that's very much our approach to how we're looking at 3D printed stuff. So I basically posed a question for this session, which is, um, if I look at my thing, it says, what shape is freedom? And what shape is freedom and what shape is the future? I would say it's us, it's our shape. And from our shape is how we're going to create these things. Thank you.